Well, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks for uh, being interested in this subject. Um, even though it's uh, a payment system from very far from this place, uh, it's still a payment system and we're talking about real money here. Okay, so, well, I'm doing all kinds of stuff, uh, Linux kernel development, um, uh, research and communication protocols, among them RFID, DEC, GSM systems, and so on. And I feel a little bit like four years ago when I last was uh, involved with OpenPCD and open source RFID reader. That's sort of really the last point in time when I, when I did RFID work. And in 2010, in August, I decided, well, let's, let's have a look in how things have developed in the last four years. And I was really surprised uh, to see what I see. So how did I end up with looking at this system in the first place? Well, starting from 2006, uh, I was doing a lot of freelancing work in Taiwan. Um, and uh, this resulted in a number of business trips uh, to Taiwan and specifically to the capital city Taipei. Um, in Taipei, as soon as you use public transport, you will see that almost nobody buys a single ride ticket, but everyone uses a small plastic card called the Easy Card. That's the English name, at least. Um, if you literally translate the Chinese name, it's more the easy travel card. But um, yeah, it's called easy card and it's supposed to make public transportation easy. Um, this was just after having worked a lot with OpenPCD and OpenPICC projects um, uh, in the RFID area. But uh, given that I was on business trips, I never really had enough time to look at the easy car system until in 2010. I thought, ah, yeah, well, let's give it a try. So what's this easy card? Um, this is, uh, as you can undoubtedly uh, recognize immediately, a, a screenshot of Wikipedia on the subject of EasyCard. So you actually see it's a contactless smart card system, who operates it, and so on. Um, you see an actual EasyCard on the bottom right-hand side. Um, so it's a, you know, just like any, any uh, credit card-sized uh, um, RFID card, just has a couple of strange colorful spots on it. Um, and as you can see already in this public website, even Wikipedia knows it is based on MyFair, right? Um, so uh, MyFair being, well, I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. Okay, so it is a card that's used in Taiwan, mostly in the capital city of Taipei. Um, it was originally deployed in 2001. That's what I found, uh, well, according to Chinese sources. Um, according to Wikipedia, it's June 2002, so there seems to be some off by one error. Um, there are more than 18 million issued cards, so it's not a small niche market or something. It's 18 million cards. It's quite a substantial user base. And it was initially only a payment system for public transportation, mostly for the Taiwan uh, Metropolitan, Rap Rap Metropolitan Rapid Transport, called MRT, which is their subway or metro or whoever you want, uh, whatever you want to call it. There are also public buses that uh, use the same card for payment. Um, it's thus, it's very similar to other RFID contactless uh, um, public transportation systems like the Oyster Card uh, in London or like, you know, any major city you travel to, um, except Berlin or except any German city, as far as I know, you, you have these RFID cards. Um, now, um, if you look at the Easy Card website, you find, you know, what it's being used for. So you have the Taipei Metro, you have bus services, also a rail line uses it for payment. All the government-run parking lots, some privately owned parking lots, roadside parking meters, a uh, mono, no, it's not a mono, it's cable car, the Maokong Gondola, some riverboat services, you know, bicycle rentals and taxis. So that's mostly transportation um, uh, that you can pay with it. Um, the system, well, um, the cards, you can buy them at machines. It's like a, a ticket machine. Instead of getting a ticket, it, you know, you get the, the easy card. Um, it's located in every subway station, and I'm quite sure there are more, but at least in every subway station, you find a couple of those machines. You pay 500 NT dollars, which is something like 12 euros, to give you um, some, uh, you know, idea what that is. And of those 500 NT dollars, 400 NT dollars are the actual value that you can spend, and 100 NT dollars is a deposit on the actual card. Um, the payment while obtaining the card is made in cash at that machine. Um, thus, since you pay with cash, there's no credit card or account number or anything linking a particular card to a particular individual. There's no uh, connection. Which, well, for, you could say for privacy reasons, that's a good thing. Um, 
I agree it's good, but still, you know, it's pseudonym, it's, it's not anonymous, it's pseudonymous, because you just don't know the association, but you still have tracking profiles of each and every individual who's traveling, but then who cares about privacy in uh, those countries anyway. Um, so, also another feature of the system is that you can get a full refund of the account balance at any given point in time, and even the deposit of the card itself by going to a counter and, um, well, returning the card and, and getting the money. Adding value to the card is made by the very same machines which are located in subway stations that sell the cards. So you, you put in your card, you put in some bills, some banknotes, and you, you get back your, char your card that has a higher value charge onto the card. Which, well, um, you know, all in all is, you know, very interesting. But then if you look at how, what, what can you pay with that card, you know, a public transport ride, which in Taipei costs you something like uh, maybe 12 to 20 NT dollars, which is, you know, something like, uh, you know, a couple of cents up to, up to 50 cents, euro cents. Um, that's not really some, you know, very attractive target for anyone. It's, you know, a couple of cents here and there. Yeah, sure, but uh, it's, you know, the, the, the fraud potential, you know, the public transportation company might, may think it's big, but I think it's not really, you know, when fraud potential is very, relatively limited. Um, so, well, it's publicly known that the EasyCard uses this NXP MyFair solution. Um, MyFair Classic, specifically, has been broken in various ways before, um, ranging from eavesdropping attacks, recovering the keys from recording conversations, to card-only attacks, where all you need is the card to recover the keys. There are so many different attacks on MyFair. Um, uh, I don't really want to repeat all of this here. Um, however, one thing to remember, and I mean, this, this talk is not about cryptographic attacks or, or anything like that. It's, it's a, you know, a practical real-world attack using the, the, the tools and the cryptographic methods that have been developed before. One thing to remember is that the card itself is only one element in the security chain. So even, you know, even if you see, oh, you know, the system uses MyFair, it must be broken. It's not that easy, um, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the statement that they use a MyFair card doesn't really mean the system is broken. Um, they could have done it in a way that it's not so, you know, not, not a big fraud potential. The big question it all comes down to, is there online or offline verification, all right? Um, if the value, the amount, the balance, your account balance, if that is stored only on the card, then of course manipulating the card is a very dangerous uh, uh, proposition because you can manipulate the value. Um, however, if you actually store the value in, in the backend database and you only use the card as a means of authenticating the user to his account but do all the transactions on the backend to the online, uh, online or to the database, then, um, well, then there wouldn't be really that much problem. Um, because, well, uh, if, even if there's a cached value on the card, if you manipulate it, the next time you make a transaction, it checks the central database and there is your real, the real value, the real balance of your card, and uh, it is determined that there is something wrong and it, it uses the value from the backend system. So I never, as I said, I mean, I've been in Taiwan since 2006, I never really looked at the system because I thought, well, you know, First of all, it's only used in public transportation, um, and subway stations are, you know, they're not that many. So it's not, it's, it's very well imaginable that they do online verification because, you know, what Taiwan, I don't know how many subway stations Taipei has, it's, let's say it's 40 or 50 maybe. Um, that, you know, it's very easy to have leased lines there and access the central database. The other thing is, well, you know, as I said, free rides, pff, uh, it's not a very, you know, not a very big uh, problem, I think. Now, in, unfortunately, you could say, in 2009, the government has created laws for, uh, they call it stored value cards. I'm not quite sure if that's a term that's really used in English. I'm not a native speaker either. Um, for a means of payment. Basically, they, they created laws um, that, so electronic cards uh, where you can deposit some money uh, can be used as, as legal uh, payment system. Of course, the EasyCard Corporation being the only one acti actually having deployed such a system in Taipei, you can, you can guess that it was uh, specifically passed uh, for, for enhancing the business of EasyCard. Now, so in early 2010, I think it was 1st April, the use of this EasyCard ex is extended beyond public transport. So now you can store up to 10,000 NT dollars, which is 240 euros, so not a, you know, a significant amount of money, giving the local purchasing power of, of that money. Um, 
And uh, the card is suddenly accepted by a lot of stores, mostly the big brands, the franchises, and so on. They all suddenly accept that card as means of payment. So suddenly the incentive is much higher. You can't only get on free metro rides, but you can suddenly buy about anything that costs less than 240 euros uh, in even the largest department stores that the town has to offer. If you again look at the website, you know, these are the designated stores. You may not recognize many of them if you haven't been to Taiwan, but uh, it's basically, you know, most of the places you run into. 7-Eleven, Family Mart, OK Mart, and High Life are the four um, uh, convenience store franchises that you find, you know, every, every hundred of meters or even less you will find one of them and they sell about anything. So uh, those are, you know, tens of thou thousands of, of stores. Welcome is the largest um, um, supermarket uh, uh, chain in, in, uh, in Taiwan and Hong Kong. And uh, there is uh, stuff like Watson's, which is a drugstore, Starbucks, everyone knows Starbucks, so, you know, coffee, so on. I'm, I can go, you know, Pizza Hut, Domino's Pizza, and so on. And also Sogo, which is a very large Japanese um, uh, department store uh, chain that has uh, various uh, department stores in Taipei City. Uh, you can also get sushi and, and Cold Stone is, is ice cream. So uh, basically you can get anything. Um, okay. Now the card uses a MyFair Classic system. Um, uh, by the way, it used to be called only MyFair, and then after some advances in security research have been made, they have retroactively renamed it to MyFair Classic. Um, so it, it's a 13.56 megahertz RFID system. It's magnetic coupling. Um, it uses uh, ISO 14443, uh, 1, 2, and 3, but it does not use ISO 14443 4 which means that up to the anti-collision level, it uses the same protocols that, for example, electronic uh, travel, uh, yeah, you actually call them travel documents, electronic passports and so on use. However, the upper layer is not the same that is used with those passports. They provide something like one to four kilobits of storage, um, which are divided in sectors and blocks. Um, and uh, they use a proprietary 48-bit cipher called Crypto One. Um, uh, you know, proprietary N48 bit should ring at least two alarm bells. Um, oh, actually, it, it uses a proprietary 48 bit symmetric cipher, right? It's a third alarm bell. Um, and uh, manufacturer and customers really believed in security by obscurity. That's something that I personally never understand. How could anyone who is uh, in charge of IT security of any system that uses my, my fair based solution, right? Yes, it's proprietary and so on, but you know, it was always publicly documented it's proprietary, 48 bit stream cipher. No, a symmetric cipher, sorry, symmetric cipher. And if you are in charge of IT security of any organization and um, you are to deploy some, something that you know, affects your business, it's, be it an access control system where that card is the only factor in authentication, or being it an electronic payment system. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how anyone responsible could, could, uh, could use such a system. So nobody should have ever used it for any application requiring any sort of security. The weaknesses in the Crypto One and the MyFair system have first been published three years ago by Hendrik Plötz and Carsten Nuhl at this very same event three years ago. Um, if some of you remember, uh, there's been, their initial presentation has uh, triggered a lot of academic research in the Netherlands and other countries, various universities. Um, and based on their initial weaknesses uh, and uh, all the security and cryptographers looking into it, a number of uh, real world attacks have been developed uh, from various different ways. Now, if you want to analyze the easy card, well, there's a couple of things we need to do. First thing is we need to find out if it is really a MyFair Classic card. I mean, it could be just that somebody heard it and put it in Wikipedia or something. Um, and that can be very easily done by, you know, applying the compatible air interface. By the way, this, a four is missing. It's ISO 14443, um, not 1443. Uh, and uh, do the anti-collision procedure and check the result values you get from there. Um, that's very easy. You can do that using OpenPCD or any other RFID reader and so on. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's a straightforward thing. The next step, of course, is, well, you want to recover the keys. Each of the sectors on the card can have two different keys, as key A and key B for 16 sectors gives you uh, 32 keys. Um, 
Uh, many cards that you will find in the real world 